Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, folks, for for coming today, and uh, we're going to talk about clean energy. Um, how nonprofits can be a part of this huge transition that's happening uh, now with the Inflation Reduction Act and so forth. I um, I'm a social worker. I grew up in Iowa City. I uh, taught at Iowa and U and I and uh, Luther College, and also was director of four different agencies around Eastern Iowa, uh, including uh, Hillcrest Family Services for 10 years and uh, several years with the Johnson County. We just started the uh, MHMRDD department back in the 90s, and and I was director of that. So so I, I kind of know the nonprofit side, um, and I'm excited to talk to some of you about the opportunities that are available now for for agencies to reduce their energy bills and um, have some money in the other parts of the budget to to do things with. So, um, Casey, do you want to say a word about yourself? And what? Well, I'll do that a little later. Okay. Great. Unless you want me to do it, I, I I'm 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 good remaining anonymous for a while. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Casey Cook is going to join us later. So. So uh, you all know this global climate change is really what's driving us in all of this work. And I don't need to tell you about the derechos and the wildfires and the, the tornadoes and stuff that are part of that. Um, but there's also this huge energy transition, transition that's getting underway now with a global shift to clean energy sources. And we're we're still uh, increasing the fossil fuels that we burn every year, I noticed this year, um, but that's gonna begin to really shift because uh, we're gonna have to get off of those fuels and wind and solar and geothermal are gonna take over some of that. Um, also uh, hydrogen and other things, but here in Iowa, we're fortunate that um, if you have Mid-American as a utility, Mid-American has heavily invested in wind and. So uh, electric rates for at least residential customers, and I assume nonprofits as well, are considerably lower than other utilities. So, uh, and because this whole process is market driven, wind is cheaper now to develop than gas fired power plants. And so people are gonna quit doing gas power plants and do wind uh, in most places and wherever that's feasible. And of course, you know, a lot of solar is happening. Um, and in the process, we are creating a ton of green jobs and local energy economies are benefiting from the jobs that are being created as we build out this uh, clean energy economy. So in the small business and housing sector, 20% of the American greenhouse gas emissions come from the residential sector. And you, sector and you add in the small businesses, that's probably another 5%, I would guess. So notice that we're in the upper Midwest where it's cold. <laughs> and so the energy intensity is the greatest uh, in, the, in the country here. Uh, we use more energy. The average home, and I would guess a lot of, of older nonprofit buildings, lose up to a third of their energy to air leaks and lack of insulation, stuff like that. So there are really three things that we need to, to do if we're gonna reduce greenhouse gases. We've gotta increase our energy efficiency, our buildings and our vehicles and all that. We've got to build renewable energy and make more of our energy from renewable sources like solar power on our roofs and stuff. And we need to do more renewable generation on the grid um, and on the large utility scale. So, so let's take a break here for a second and just see what um, folks have. And uh, Mary and Ryan, um, maybe you could sort of briefly tell us what your situation is and your agency and with energy, and we can kind of tailor what we're talking about to to you folks' needs. So, Ryan, do you want to start out? Sure, be happy to. And. Craig, I think our paths may have crossed at the School of Social Work. When I graduated 
oh, in 09 true. with my bachelor's and my master's degree in 2011. So there you go. All right. Yeah. So I'm really excited to see you doing this work and excited to be back, kind of boomeranged out of the community and came back in 2022. Uh, okay. So been, like Ellie said, the new executive director uh, at the North Liberty Community Pantry. So we currently are in a, a, we're actually, we operate programming out of two buildings that are owned by the First United Methodist Church in North Liberty. Um, the pantry building that I'm located in is under 2,400 square feet. Uh, and then we have another metal building that we operate our clothing distribution out of uh, that's around 400 square feet. So all in all, uh, around 27, 2,800 square feet of space. Uh, the amount of service that we've done since 2021, we've doubled the number of families we served. We've distributed the double, double amount, the poundage of food. Um, we are growing exorbitantly. Uh, such that we have been exploring a new building to better accommodate this. So <clears throat> we're trying to pursue uh, the purchase of land in North Liberty uh, that would accommodate a building of around 10,500 square feet. Okay. Uh, so what we're, we're still very much in the design process. We've got a site plan ready, not a construction plan yet. Uh, but we have identified a desire for solar and a desire for uh, things like heat pumps and other energy efficient opportunities uh, in the new building. So we're definitely in that kind of like idea generation about what's possible and uh, things that are of interest. Uh, we've got a lot of, I would say, environmentally minded folks that are supporters of us. Uh, we have the land we're looking at is connected to a bike trail, and we're talking about doing grocery deliveries via bicycle, uh, which will be really exciting project for us. But uh, just lots of interest and lots of different opportunities that will be available. I mentioned Alliant Energy will be the new location's uh, source, and we're currently on Lynn County Rec land. So, Well, that, that's really interesting because of the opportunities that present. Ryan, because mm -hmm. with the high uh, utility cost with Alliant, the payback period on your solar system is going to be considerably shorter. Right. And once you get off of using Alliant and generating your own electricity, you're going to be saving a ton of money in your budget. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting opportunity. Um, yeah. So yeah, okay. Well, we can talk some more about that as we go along. Uh, Mary, what's your situation? Yeah, hi. I, so I'm Mary Issa. I'm the executive director of NAMI Johnson County, and um, currently we're renting two spaces. Uh, we have an admin office space, I don't know, 2,000 square feet, and then another space for a peer recovery center. It's a drop-in center for people living with mental illness and I'm just here to learn, um, you know, on the horizon, uh, we're hopefully going to maybe have a, a space that we can purchase and have for ourselves. Um, so I'm just here to learn, gather okay. information. Okay. So it sounds like both of you are going to be in your existing buildings, you know, for a while. And there may be some things that, that would be worth doing even there. Um, to kind of be, become more efficient. So we can talk about that as we go. And so as Ellie said, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question as we go. We're a small enough group. We don't need to be too formal. Um, and that'll help kind of uh, keep us tuned in to what's going on. Let me share the screen again. Um, That's great. Okay, good. Going forward, we might talk about things like bike racks and EV charging and all that, but we'll we'll get there. So given that situation, how can we save some money doing some of this stuff? And the, the first thing, obviously, as we talked about, is being more energy efficient. And when you're planning new buildings, obviously you're gonna design them to, to, to do this. Um, 
in terms of all kinds of things, and we can talk about that if you like. Um, but also, um, you can, even in your existing buildings for the next couple of years, while you, before you get a new building, it may be worth um, doing things like LED bulbs. Um, and uh, you're probably not going to be insulating your buildings, especially if you rent. Um, but you can think about ways that you can, it might be worth putting in smart thermostats if you don't have them already um, to kind of keep your control on your usage a little bit. Um, but the elect the energy efficiency for other folks who may be listening later can get you almost halfway to the emission reductions that we need just with efficiency alone. It's kind of remarkable how, how inefficient we are right now. Um, and the, the mantra is to reduce your energy use before you start producing it yourself. Before you put solar, you, you make your building as efficient as you can. And if you're designing new, that's obviously an opportunity there. Um, just some figures for, for other folks. You can switch 10 old LED bulbs, uh, 10 old bulbs to LEDs and save up to $100 per year. Um, even fluorescence, you can save 80% on your electric use by using LEDs instead of regular fluorescence. Low flow shower heads. Uh, and the other piece of this is some of you are gonna be working with clients who could be doing some of this work. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that residential situation where, um, Mary, if you're working with clients who are living in other places, they may be able to save some money on their energy bills um, with things like low flow shower heads and stuff. So um, we've actually helped uh, some places like the Housing Fellowship and HACAP install those in some of those units. So um, that kind of thing can make a difference. And then improving insulation and air sealing and ventilation can save you like up to 15% on heating and cooling costs. Um, another thing that we can tell clients is fans in the summer, if they don't have air conditioning, can make a huge difference. And box fans stuck in a window can make a pretty good exhaust fan and stuff. So, so that can help too. And then renewable energy uh, just one example, this is residential, but uh, if a solar system at $15,000 uh, sort of average cost, minus the, the IRA Inflation Re uh, Re Reduction Act tax credit, 4,500, cuts that investment down to 10,005. And some of these are gonna be available for nonprofits as well. So. Uh, that's about an eight to 10 year payback, but it's probably even quicker than that with Alliance high rates. So um, we can kind of keep those options in mind. The basic mantra that, that we're trying to talk to people about is to electrify everything that we can. Interesting book by Saul Griffith, where he talks about this. He's an engineer. But over the 10 year period of the Inflation Recovery Act, as heaters and furnaces and air conditioners and stoves wear out, if we replace those with highly energy efficient appliances, then we can have a significant difference. Uh, and your clients can be thinking this too if they happen to own their own homes, um, or we'll, we're gonna try to talk landlords into doing this too. We'll see about that. Um, but generating electricity with wind and solar um, is gonna make a big difference by electrifying that. Johnson County just built a, a 50 acre solar field or just approved a 50 acre solar field down near Lone Tree. Um, so the county is actually on board doing some of this work as well. And of course, we're gonna to have to expand and upgrade the electric grid. Um, we're gonna have uh, lots of electric vehicles and more electric homes. And uh, Casey and I were just talking about the, uh, the new server farm that's going in up in Cedar Rapids is gonna take a lot of power too. So, so how do we pay for all this? Well, notice that there are two costs when you upgrade uh, appliances or furnaces or something like that. There's the purchase price and, and the 
those are higher up front in the beginning. Or if you're building a new building, you're going to pay more for some of those things in your construction budget. But the monthly utility bill for the next 10 or 20 years needs to be factored into that. So when you pencil that out, you can save enough. Sometimes these things will pay for themselves in three to five years, sometimes a little more. But one of the interesting things about nonprofits, agencies, churches, schools, we're in it for the long haul, right? We're, you're talking about building those buildings for, for the foreseeable future. So you want to do what's going to be energy efficient in the long run. Energy Star products are a really good way to make those choices. Um, and sometimes that Energy Star rating is required to get uh, money back from the, the Inflation Recovery Act. So kind of be watching for that and the other regulations about that. So this Inflation Recovery Act, Reduction Act, is a game changer. This is transforming this whole field because this federal program is going to help pay for these renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. So 30% uh, tax credits. And those can be direct payments to nonprofits. So um, there's some complexities to that, but but there are it's set up so that nonprofits that don't have tax liability can get these direct payments of 30% uh, on these projects. So uh, this is individuals take a credit on their income tax, business the same way, nonprofits direct payment, local governments. For low-income households, for your clients, there are remarkable uh, rebate programs available who are waiting for the state of Iowa to implement this because it's a federal program but has to go through the state. So it may be the end of the year before we actually see this money. But for example, a low-income household defined as 80% of the area median income for two people, that's $70,000 in Iowa City. Um, so it's pretty affordable for people. Um, a lot of people are going to benefit from this. And some of those households are going to get up to 100% of the cost of these projects and putting insulation in their attics and um, solar on their roofs and so forth. So some of the things that are covered, uh, <clears throat> insulation, doors and windows, um, appliances, heat pump, water heaters, and furnaces, and air conditioners, um, dryers and stoves. They do have to be certified, and you do have to keep the documentation. Um, and I believe we can check on this, but I believe that new construction does not qualify for, for IRA benefits. Um, your benefits are going to come in the long run as you save money on your utility bills. But um, there are some limitations and there's a lot of regulations about this is a federal program, right? So there's going to be plenty of regulations. Um, but the uh, for residential people, there's a $1,200 limit per year on home improvements. But it, you can do that every year. So you can do you know, your furnace one year and air conditioner put in a heat pump. The next year you can do the insulation, whatever. Um, you might do insulation first, but you, you can do it over a period of years. Uh, some appliances, you can get up to $2,000 for for heat pump uh, furnaces and air conditioner things and stuff. Um, and you can even get, if you have a home energy audit at a residential setting, you can get $150 back towards the cost of that. Um, a word about electric vehicles. Um, this may not apply a lot at this point. Uh, nonprofits typically don't buy their own cars, but um, there is a $7,500 tax credit on new vehicles that's now available at the point of sale. 
They have to be made in the U.S. Um, and there's a price cap of fifty-five thousand, um, and an income cap of thirty three hundred thousand if you're married. Um, but if you buy a Chevy Bolt for twenty six five, your out of pocket is nineteen thousand because of this rebate, uh, this tax credit. So, used cars, uh, four thousand dollar tax credit. Um, it has to be one owner. It's got to be over two years old. Has to be bought from a dealer. And it has to be under twenty five thousand, and it's going to be available at the point of sale, so dealers can can write this into the contract. So that's a heck of a deal, and it may be that agencies are going to want to be putting charging stations in for employees who are going to be coming to to do this. So the equity side of this is really important to the um, the Johnson Clean Energy District and all of our work together. Um, I should probably back up just a second and say a bit about the energy district. There are 12 of us around the state now. Uh, we're modeled after the soil and water conservation districts. So it's a citizens board working on energy uh, work. And um, we're trying to implement the IRA. We're trying to help homeowners and small businesses take advantage of these federal benefits. So we have an energy coaching program that I'll talk about a bit at the end um, that could be available to, um, if you have clients who are living in uh, manufactured homes, they're owning their own home. And so they're gonna be eligible to do this work, um, even though a lot of your rental clients are not. So, so the equity piece of this revolves around what we call energy cost burden, which is the percentage of the household income that goes to pay for energy. And the average nationally is three and a half percent. But a lot of low income households pay much more than that, as you well know. And so it can be up to 16 to 20 percent. So their energy bills are just unfair. Um, and they often don't have any control if they're renting the landlord passes that cost on to them and they don't have any control over that. Um, so we need to work on the landlords too, but that's that's another discussion. <laughs> so um, there are also health impacts. As you've probably heard, um, gas uh, stoves and ovens emit toxic chemicals into the home environment. And kids have higher asthma rates in homes with gas uh, stoves and ovens. Um, and so th this is a, and, and furnaces. So this is a concern. There's also, of course, the environmental burden of the extreme weather. And a lot of folks at the lower end, end of the scale live in older drafty homes. And so they need more energy anyway, just because their homes are less efficient. So there's motivation to try to do this work. So how, how do we get started? The first thing is to learn about your home energy needs or your business's energy needs. And we have a couple of things that can help with that. We've got a brochure and a checklist on our website, uh, johnsoncleanenergydistrict.org, um, that you can do to just do a quick walkthrough of your building and see what you know the, uh, the low-hanging fruit is. And it gives you an idea of where you can start. Some of it's do-it-yourself stuff. Uh, some of it's easy, quick repairs uh, that are worth doing. And you can look at that brochure and checklist. And if you have trouble finding them, uh, just email me and uh, I'll send them to you. We also have an energy coaching program where we do home visits by an energy coaches who will go through and do an audit of the energy that you used in your home. They'll look at your appliances and your insulation and weather stripping and all that stuff and give you a computerized report that prioritizes the things that changes that you can make. So those are things that are available. Um, these home uh, energy efficiency assessment tools, uh, you can start with LED bulbs and shower heads, insulating, uh, sealing up your uh, hot water pipes and your your energy ducts. Um, and then more detailed stuff, you can get into insulation and windows and air sealing and furnaces and all that. So 
Um, and then consider solar power. And since some a couple of you are talking about new buildings, this is a prime consideration. Um, you can save money in the long run by going solar at this point. Uh, we've worked a lot with the Unitarian Church in Coralville that put a large solar field outside and more on the roof. Um, and they're reaping the benefits of that. They've got heat pumps there. Um, and they, they built that building, oh, four or five years ago now, um, to be highly energy efficient and to use solar. So Casey Cook is here. Um, he's an investor who's been trying to help low and uh, pro uh, nonprofits uh, take advantage of solar opportunities. So Casey, tell us how that works. Thanks, Greg. Um, so what really, what got me into this in the first place, uh, I, I now have um, five solar arrays. Three of them are with Goodwill. One was, was is with DVIP and another one, which is a weird, really weird one is uh, owned by the Pitt River Indians in Northern California. And um, they're not the easiest negotiating partners, I have to say. Anyway, what got me interested in this, uh, because low-income people, uh, for the most part, don't own their own houses, I thought it'd be in order to, for them to benefit from the solar rev revolution, the, the nonprofits that serve them um, can can benefit in a lot of ways, as, as uh, Craig has just outlined. Um, so the, the, the nonprofits that are serving the low-income people are an, an easier sell, I would say, and um, uh, whatever income they save from it, from uh, uh, providing solar, uh, they can pass on to their clients. And that's unlike, a, you know, a, a lot of uh, commercial businesses. So that was the that was the original incentive. And the second thing that that um, I've come to terms with is that um, if the if the utility companies don't own the uh, solar array, they they typically kind of drag their feet a little bit. I don't want to diss the the utilities companies because it's their market share and all that, but because of things like the new Google plant and, and whatnot and the energy uses, their demand is just skyrocketing. And so, so there's, a, there's, a, um, there's an opportunity, I think, for, for uh, what I call distributed solar, not owned by the utilities, owned by the people that, that uh, have their businesses. Um, the, the, the deal I had I have with uh, Goodwill, for example, the three arrays that I have there, I've been able to follow them for the last five years. And um, the, the arrangement that we have is I own the solar arrays. I get the tax benefits, the, in, the um, uh, investment tax credit, but there's also um, a depreciation allowance, which nonprofits cannot take advantage of. But me as a private investor, I can because I have an appetite for, for those things. That depreciation, uh, which you can write off the whole array in the first year, saves me probably an additional um, 25% of the cost of the solar array. So the upshot is um, I have an arrangement with them. Uh, they, they pay, they, their total cost to Alliant is like 17 cents a kilowatt. Um, I collect 12 and a half cents a kilowatt for five years. I get all the tax benefits and then I sell it back to them for 30% less than it costs me. So it's a way of um, sort of passing on the uh, investment tax credit. So for me, it's a win. I make some money on it. The uh, nonprofit, it's a win. Their clients, it's a win. And uh, for the environment, it's a win. Uh, with the with the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of things changed. Um, the free medical clinic, for example, is just, uh, uh, they're, they're working on putting up some solar panels right now. And as with anything, the devil is kind of in the details. And I don't mean to be discouraging on this, but 
um, you you get the 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 invest you get the the cash of thirty percent a year after you you put in the array. So you almost have to figure out a way to to rate. Let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollar array. That, that's a pretty good size one. That's about come to think of that's that's about the size of the one in uh, DVIP and uh, uh, free medical clinic. Um, um, having lost my train of thought, uh, anyway, you, 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 uh, you get the 30% benefit and then as an investor, you get another 25%. And so, uh, the, uh, the, the solar array that I did with DVIP because it's in the mid America, um, uh, service area, the way we arranged it, they, they raised a bunch of money from the local Rotary Club, our, our noon Rotary Club, and they raised $53,000. And so I said, well, I'll come up with the other, you know, the difference between $100,000 and $53,000, which off the top of my head is about $47,000. Um, and uh, because I'm the owner, I'll be able to take advantage of the, the tax benefits. And at that time, uh, nonprofits could not take advantage of any tax benefits because they don't pay taxes, but I could. And, and I treated that 53,000 that the Rotary Clubs raised as income. So I paid, you know, I, I was paying income taxes on that. But then after all, after everything is said and done, um, I pretty much break even and uh, DVIP pays, you know, their electrical bill is, is much smaller than it, you know, would normally be. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, the office building that I used to own, it's about, um, it's 4,200 square feet of finished space on the main floor and about 2,000 square feet of, un, uh, of finished space on the basement level. And we put in, a, we put in an array and at that time, I think it was a fifty thousand dollar array. And um, our our last um, electrical bill in February and March was ten dollars. And 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 for the whole year, our electrical bill was about forty five hundred. Um, and that's that's changed rather significantly now. It's uh, you know, the, the, for the whole year, it's about 1100. So we, we saved significantly on that. We also, we, we went through the, um, we have fluorescent lighting and we changed out the, the lighting on it as well. So that's been a very satisfactory investment for us. Um, there's something more on that. Um, the thing that I want to emphasize is it's more like paying the electoral bills is more like a movie than it is like a snapshot. I mean, everybody thinks, well, there, you know, our costs are 12 and a half cents a kilowatt or 17 in the case of Alliant. But the fact is that Alliant has been raising their rates about 3% a year for uh, probably the last 13 years. So they're closing in on right now, they're at about 39% higher than they were 13 years ago. So that's what I mean about a, about a movie. And when you've got something like the Google plant coming in, there's gonna be using a lot more energy and that's gonna drive energy costs up. In, in uh, California, for example, I think the average cost for the Pitt River Indians is about 37 cents. And uh, I get 21 cents out of that. So they save about $8,000 a year and I, and I make about $10,000 a year. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, an interesting, uh, fun fact. As a nonprofit, you're, you're going to have to raise the additional capital. And then you're, you're going to have to, there is a, uh, uh, a green bank. By that, I mean a, a bank that finances all these things. Uh, that's funded by the federal government, and it just came out to the tune of $20 billion. And we're hoping to be able to take advantage of that. It depends very much on what, what the interest rates are and, and whatnot, that kind of thing. But you'll basically, 
you won't save any money for the first eight to nine years. And then after that, you know, you'll, you own it free and clear. You have paid off the mortgage or the loan and um, uh, you'll, you'll get free utilities after that. The question is, is I've sold a couple of buildings that have had solar arrays on them. And these were commercial buildings and the solar array the way it, this is getting a little bit too much into the weeds, I think, but the solar or the solar array sold for e an equivalent amount to the building. Solar arrays typically last 25 years. You don't want to have a solar array uh, on a roof, for example, or your, when your roof is only good for like 10, 15 years, you don't want to have to take it down and put it back up. That's what I'm doing with the Pitt River Indians. Um, but the, the, um, so the, the three things you have to keep in mind. One is you have to own your own roof. Two, it's got to be in fairly decent shape. And three, the, the whole thing, if you're getting a new building, you might just be able to wrap that in with the mortgage, depending on how they value it. Um, so those are things to consider. That. Any, uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, so let me just finish out three more slides or so, and then we'll um, we'll take some questions. And let's see, is this working, Ellie? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Well, no. there we go. Okay. So this is one of our energy coaches. Um, they can go into homes. If you have uh, folks in manufactured homes, we would love to go into their homes and do uh, energy audits on them because they're uh, assuming they own the, own the home. Um, and that's a good opportunity for them to save some money. Um, so we can go in and evaluate the, the home and the situation, answer their questions. But the, the auditor energy coach also follows up. So after the audit, they will stick with that homeowner and help them kind of get the work done and so forth. So these guys have over 40 years experience in Johnson County doing home inspections and stuff. And, and they're contra former contractors. And so they know how to uh, help people get the, the work done and so forth. So a few things you can uh, use as resources. Uh, our Johnson Clean Energy District org uh, website has a good energy newsletter that you could uh, ask your, your clients could look at that and you might as well. Um, there are a lot of resources at that website for some of these energy efficiency issues. There's good information there to to find out ways to make your building more efficient. The US Department of Energy is a great resource. Uh, they've got a lot of information now about appliances, about financial incentives, uh, household energy management. A couple key places are energysaver.gov and energystar.gov. Another key website is put on by the Iowa Environmental Council and it's called the Iowa Energy and Infrastructure Funding Hub, kind of an awkward title, but um, you might wanna jot down this URL, iafederalfunding.org, fund, um, because it's a great resource on all these federal programs and they keep it up to date. Um, here are some other resources and Ellie has the, the PowerPoint, so she'll be able to uh, share that with people. Um, but the clean energy economy um, at cleanenergy.gov. Rewiring America is another very helpful organization, uh, rewiringamerica.org. Um, they've got a lot of really good information about energy efficiency and renewable energy. As I mentioned, the Iowa Environmental Council, uh, the Johnson Clean Energy District, and my email is right there, craig.r.mosier at gmail. Uh, I'll be glad to answer questions and stuff. So, um, so 
you can look at whether it's worth doing LED bulbs and thermostats and sealing up your pipes and ducts. Um, you may want to consider air sealing windows and doors. Look at the age of your furnaces and air conditioners, water heaters, refrigerators. Um, all of the refrigeration equipment, uh, air conditioners and refrigerators are much more efficient than they were 10 years ago. So even if it's not at the end of its life, it's may be worth replacing anyway, insulating uh, and considering solar panels. So, all right, well, why don't we open it up to questions? Um, uh, Mary and Ryan, what what can we do to answer some of you, help you th think what you're doing next? <laughs> sure, <clears throat> thanks for all that information. I'm interested if uh, the, the Johnson Clean Energy District has some um, brochures or something that we would be able to distribute for families we serve uh, to let them know about some of the opportunities they might have for those energy audits and some of the other resources that you mentioned. You bet. Um, why don't you send me an email and I'll send those to you. And did you get my address and Craig. It was Craig dot r dot mosher m-o-s-h-e-r yep at gmail perfect yep i will send you an email great yeah and we're still in the i mentioned the early stages of some of our construction planning and we're looking at a rooftop array but we also have some land we'd like to to maintain space to have a garden uh, uh -huh. to use but Wondered about uh, capacity-wise, thoughts about the ground array versus a rooftop array or a combination of the two. Well, the, the Unitarians did both. Uh, Casey, what do you think? think? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I've been pricing out the rooftop arrays versus the, the ground arrays. And the ground arrays, um, they're a little more expensive. But um, because they allow for more circulation around them, more cool air, it winds up being, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. But the other right. thing that you might want to keep in mind, there are certain plants that you can grow under an array. It's not uh, incompatible with a nice garden and tomato plants and flowers and that kind of thing. But uh, take a hard look. because Obviously, they're getting a lot of the sunshine and your plants aren't. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, that's a great point. Let's see. <clears throat> Casey, I really appreciated you sharing kind of what you've been able to do and the partnerships that you have. And I'm a little interested in learning a little bit more about that uh, investment opportunity. And it sounds like the way that you've been able to do this with DVIP and Goodwill is putting some dollars in up front uh, to get the install complete and then coming back to you in the form of tax credit and or you're also selling back some of the energy generated from that what well, can i tell you any more about that brian ryan yeah i just wanted to make sure i understood that correctly that that was kind of the way you had that model set up with the examples it, you shared with. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of information to absorb. Um, but basically, I was able to take advantage of the depreciation. The depreciation is something you can take advantage of is if you have passive income. So they set it up so that if you don't have any passive income. And a passive income is like if you have rental properties or rental farms or anything like that then you can take advantage of it. If you don't have that, you're kind of um, out of luck. Um, so, uh, but that, it, it's worked pretty well with uh, DVIP. I, I, you know, I, I figure that in order for it to work, it's about, um, uh, you'd need to raise about 55% of the money um, to, to put the array on. And then, uh, you know, after that, there's nothing you have to worry about. I'm, I'm going to be selling them back to them for a dollar after five years. So mm -hmm. that's that's how that works. But 
obviously, you know, raising the money in the first place uh, is the is the challenge. But I but I really I would really look into if um, they value the whole building with the solar array, which they might not. They might, you know, talk about a separate loan or, you know, not all the banks give loans on solar arrays, but they might be able to issue you a mortgage first. You know, let's say the building is worth 100,000, the solar array is worth 50, they give you 80% of the whole thing. Then, you know, you're, you're steps ahead because you're going to be getting the, the uh, 30% within a year. Well, a couple of things let me add to this. One is that another um, bank opportunity is called Green Penny. Up in uh, the Decora Bank, uh, started a new bank basically within the Decora Bank called Green Penny. Um, and I think it's just greenpenny.org. And they are financing uh, solar projects. And um, so that's a good source to go to for, for financing on the solar part, at least. I, I don't know what they would do about the mortgage. Um, the other thing I learned, Casey- well, can, I, can I add on to that a little bit, yeah. Craig? Go ahead, yep. Um, you know, I think they're, be, they're, they're well positioned to be able to take advantage of some of the federal funding that's coming up with the $20 billion. And, and right now they're not giving a lot of loans because they're, they don't have enough deposits. I think this this may uh, help them considerably late, and they'll they'll be back in you know in the business. I guess I would say those loans are going for solar at eight and a half percent. They give two. I won't get into it, but it's complex. You know, it's it's not so complicated that uh, it, it would be difficult for you. Well, that, that yeah. that's good news. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, Casey, was I, I did talk with Brianna, who's working on the free med project, and and she said that you need to be careful if you're raising money for a new building. If you say that the fundraising drive is for solar power, you cannot get the tax, 30% tax credit but or rebate. But if you just do a general fundraising drive, and don't identify it as being necessarily for solar, you can get that. So that's a powerful thing to know when you- That's, you a, that's the kind of hair splitting that uh, you're gonna be dealing with. Yeah. That <laughs> seems like, so for another example, meta, there's a, a, a state law that if you develop solar on one property, you can't sell it to the property on an adjacent lot. But what we think is that because mobile home parks are all one big lot, I mean, they rent individual pads, but they're all one big lot or a condominium association generally has, you know, one big lot that you could develop solar on that lot and feed the whole mobile home park. We think that's possible, but uh, we haven't tried it yet. And uh, I think we'd like to. I'll talk when to you I about when I say we, I'm talking about uh, Johnson County Solar Group and Better Together and ICAD and whatnot. Well, uh, Casey, we ought to talk about that because mobile home parks are a prime source of low-income homeowners who could. Yeah, we think they're the we think they're the low-hanging fruit, yeah. and when you get into low-income home homeowners you get additional investment tax credits. So I don't know what they are, but you know, 10, 20%, something like that. So that could that could really help, I think. Yep. So Mary, do you have any questions on? I don't, I appreciate all the information. Okay. But I don't have any Mary, questions. Um, you, you know, the, the first stuff that Craig talked about the, um, the, the new light bulbs and, and energy audits and those kinds of things. I know it's very difficult to, to raise money for uh, mental health uh, issues, it seems like. Uh, but uh, my Rotary Club uh, is going to be donating a new uh, copier machine to you, I understand. Yes, they are. <laughs> I got the OK yesterday. Good deal. <laughs> well, and, and Mary, if you have clients who could use LED bulbs, 
I've got some left over from another grant that um, I could give you, you know, several boxes and you could pass them out to your clients to put in there. Even if they're renting, if they put an LED bulb in, <laughs> it's going to save you money on your electric bill and you can take it out when you leave the apartment and take it with right. you. And, uh, yeah, just, that'd be great. Um, so just get in touch with me and I'll, I'll get you some bulbs if you like. And, okay, thank you. And those bulbs last forever. Right. Yeah, they're good for years. I'm an old man and they'll all outlive me, but if I was 40 years old, I'd say the same thing. <laughs> Any other questions? How are we doing, Ellie? Wonderful. Well, thank you, Craig and Casey, for sharing so much with us today. I have the slides and I also grabbed all of those resources um, I was putting links in the chat as you were speaking, Craig, <laughs> but I will also put them online on our nonprofit resources page so you can go back and find them at a later date um, or let me know. We'll put the recording up there as well and we'll make sure to share it out for Earth Day so other folks see it. Um, but really appreciate you being with us, Ryan and Mary, and thank you for all you shared with us, Craig and Casey. Hopefully we'll see all of you soon. Um, Really, my only other kind of update is reminder that May 1st is Great Give Day this year. So hopefully our organizations are already ready to participate in that. Um, and same on the kind of donor side. So we hope to see a lot of engagement with all of our nonprofits in the county that day, uh, whether or not that's through donations or just kind of awareness building and education about who we are and what we do. So hope to see all of your great things on, on May 1st. All right. I think Thank that's all I got. All. Thank you. Thank for the you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks all.